First things first, the glasses. My old glasses broke. I have to go see a doctor to get new ones. So you're stuck with these until I can work that out. And I don't know how long that'll take in Corona times. The period I'm gonna talk about today takes place immediately after World War II in the country of Japan. In the years leading up to World War II, Japan had become militaristic, authoritarian, and nationalistic. The ability to even express dissident political opinions had been greatly suppressed in the country. Then there was the Second World War, which for this period of Japanese history was sort of an apocalyptic collapse. Very literally apocalyptic because the Americans used nuclear weapons on Japanese citizens. Not only was it horribly devastating for the Japanese people, but also the advent of this new dangerous technology kind of still hovers over our species like a sword of Damocles. But one of the important things for this story is that during the war, in order to keep the machine running, the Japanese government organized labor and made structures and infrastructure to keep the Japanese workers coordinated with each other. And after the war ended, the Americans arrived. <laughs> The supreme commander of the Allied forces in Japan was General Douglas MacArthur, an American general who's kind of infamous for, you know, sicking troops on World War I veterans trying to get their bonuses. And under MacArthur's occupation, Japan fundamentally changed from the very top to the very bottom. The literal god emperor to many Japanese people went on the radio and announced that he was indeed a human. And the American occupiers went through something which is called a revolution from above, which is where changes are made to society not through grassroots movement, but by affecting and directly going to the elites and rulers of society. The Japanese people experienced a whole lot of new freedoms. Democracy, freedom of speech, gender equality built into the Japanese constitution. There was a whole lot happening. There was an unintended side effect, though. The Americans gave the Japanese political freedom to organize under any ideology that they see fit, you know, except for worshiping the emperor. What the Americans didn't anticipate is that a whole lot of Japanese people would use this freedom to almost instantly become leftists. But before we go into that story, I wanna talk about this video's sponsor, Boxu. So Boxu is a service where they send you a box of Japanese snacks. And as somebody who, when I travel abroad, is always interested in what new and strange confections have been thought up in other countries, I thought this was pretty awesome. So if you've got somebody with an adventurous palate, this is the holidays, pretty good time to try this out. First time customers of Boxu will get one of these, which is a Seasons of Japan bundle, a sort of sampling of different seasonal and regional snacks from across Japan. Click the card to get the full unboxing video. And if you continue to be a customer of Boxu, You'll then get regional and seasonal boxes that are focused around particular themes. Some examples might be winter in Hokkaido or the colors of Kyoto. I've been nibbling on these for about a week and it has been quite a cool experience to see uh, different cultures and different countries uh, do their take on junk food. And I always, um, I'm always really, it's always really cool to see that. And unlike the US occupiers, wow, that's a transition. Boxu actually honors Japanese tradition and culture and works with locals to bring authentic flavors around the globe. And I have to say thank you for Boxu for recommending I do a video on the topic of Japan. I uh, came across this awesome gem of a subject, so that's awesome. If you're interested in trying out Boxu, I have a promo code that you can use to get 10% off your snack box, so. Uh, that's good eating. As you can see, there's not that much left. Now back to depressing Japanese history involving socialism. Welcome to Step Back History, where Step Back History is explained. Please subscribe and hit the bell notification to get more videos. So after the United States conquered Japan, they had a goal to try and rebuild the country from scratch into a modern, industrialized, capitalist country. So they were surprised to find when very uh, uncapitalist groups started to pop up, like the Democratic People's Front. Because of racist assumptions about Japanese people, the United States kind of just assumed that the Japanese people would just kind of go with the flow, and if they introduced capitalism and democracy, or their version of democracy, that Japan would just, you know, take it. And with the American conception of politics and their assumptions about Japanese people, they didn't really conceive that radical politics might start to bubble up from below. They were too busy focused on 
their revolution from above, which isn't exactly the most democratic thing you can do. It's really strange to sort of have your country torn apart and then have all of the elites and rich people start forcing democracy on you. But things get a little bit more complicated because while this was done in a very undemocratic manner, they did implement things like democracy and women's rights and civil liberties. At least that's the way that the Americans tell it. This is a little bit more complex, a little bit more of a give and take. For example, leftists and socialists and radical labor leaders played a pretty big role in the way that Japan recovered after World War II. After the war ended, the government lifted a ban on communist parties and also implemented a whole lot of very strong labor laws. But how did those happen? Well, as soon as the war ended, Japan had many socialists and they were able to be public again. And one of the first things they did was make major inroads into labor politics. Unionization was rapidly increasing and the amount of unionized workers expanded from maybe about 100,000 at the end of the war to over 5 million people a year later. And a lot of political agitation for workers' rights happened because they were able to so quickly mobilize workers into these huge protests. So Japan had a whole bunch of strikes. The public sector unions were extremely radical. And because of massive inflation after the war, Japanese workers were suffering in both white and blue collar jobs, which meant that for a very rare occasion, office workers and sort of blue collar workers had common cause and they could fight for the same rights. It's a lot more class solidarity in that period. Another innovation that really helped these protesters was something called Saisan Kanri. I'm just gonna have to apologize for the Japanese there. It's not a language I speak. What Saisan Kanri is, is essentially a reverse strike. So instead of these workers shutting down factories by not working, what they would do is continue working and kick out all of the bosses. So they would lock out all of the managers and all of the corporate owners and take over the company or factory or rail line or whatever themselves. And they wouldn't give it back until their demands were met. This was a way that they could protest workers' rights. At the same time, they would not be blamed for holding up the recovery of Japan after such a devastating war. The American occupiers and the Japanese government still tried, but to everybody, it was very obvious that this was ringing hollow. Japanese leftists also had a unique strategy, which was pushed by a famous communist Japanese celebrity named Nosaka Sanzo. He returned to Japan in 1946 after fighting for the Chinese communists to massive fanfare. Everywhere he went, especially when he arrived in Tokyo, there were massive gatherings to see his arrival. And this was across the cultural divide. Women showed up in traditional and modern clothing to come see him. And so Nosaka is the person who came up with the strategy, which was to create what he called a lovable communist party. The idea was that Japan would change and get massive leftist reforms, possibly even a communist revolution, peacefully. In order to get more widespread acceptance, the Communist Party tampered down a lot of its more radical positions that would be at odds with the Japanese people. These weren't anti-capitalist things, but it was stuff like saying that the monarchy probably shouldn't be brought out in the middle of the night and executed, like what happened in Russia, but something more akin to if Japan truly became a democratic society, then we can get together and vote the monarchy out of power. And the high watermark in these really early years came from a massive protest which occurred right before the 1946 elections in Tokyo. It was a big coordinated effort by a bunch of major labor unions. They were able to bring multiple people to Tokyo, the capital, by working together. Bus drivers would use their buses to bring protesters. Notably, the train workers union uh, took over the rail lines in order to give free rides to all of the farmers out in the country and have them all come into the city for the big rally. And this was a big event. 50,000 workers came out waving red flags, calling for the end of the Yoshida government. And they went right to the prime minister's office to make their demands for food, for equality, for more labor rights to his face. The only thing that ended the protest was a bunch of Tokyo police 
and a bunch of American military police showing up with armored jeeps and machine guns. There were no major injuries, but uh, the people who were there definitely got the message. While they weren't able to end the Yoshida government, they did find out that they were not as alone as they thought, and they wanted to build upon this success to even more successes. And what was coming up was May Day. May Day is an important holiday for all workers. It's a day of honor for the people who died in the Haymarket Massacre, which uh, I will link to a Thoughts Line video about that because it's pretty good, and is International Labor Day. It's the fight for the rights of workers. Now, since the 1930s, Japan had actually banned the celebrating of Labor Day in the country. So when May Day was coming around in 1946, these labor activists took the opportunity to organize a big event. And big event it was. There were demonstrations across the country, including 500,000 people at a massive rally in Tokyo. Again, they called for the end of the Yoshida government. There was positive press coverage of the event. They compared the rally to great heroic battles of the past. And one interesting thing that happened was that a group of protesters were allowed to go into the Imperial Palace. And while they visited the Imperial Palace, these people who had been fighting for even basic food, food deliveries had been behind. And so there was a lot of food security issues. And they saw the Imperial Kitchen fully stocked with all sorts of exquisite, decadent food, all for the Emperor while people in Japan were starving. So, after May Day, they thought, we've had one May Day, yes, but what about second May Day? And they organized another major event, which they were gonna call Food May Day. This was about food security and making sure that everybody had the food they needed. And as part of their lovable revolution line, they decided to make this framed as a direct appeal to the emperor. This event brought out tons of workers of all ages, but it brought out an especially large number of women and children. And at the rally, instead of talking about workers' rights and labor law, they talked about being unable to feed their families. One famous example was a woman with an extremely skinny baby who talked about the horrors of not even being able to get enough rice gruel to feed her young child. And all of this was held directly in front of the Imperial Palace, where all of those fancy foods were being cooked inside. The government responded by arresting the leader of Food May Day. They found a sign at the event that might not have even been written by the organizers that criticized the emperor. They arrested the leader for basically insulting the emperor, which was a crime back in the you know, war times. And despite there being no law in the books, they tried him and sentenced him to eight months. But the day after his conviction, he was let go with imperial amnesty. And to placate the masses who were trying to get food for their children, Emperor Hirohito did a national uh, radio address where he called upon them to band together and work in collective sacrifice for the greater good. It was a sort of cop-out, a bland politician -y statement that really said nothing about the hardships his own people were going through. And Douglas MacArthur, the American general who was the supreme commander of the Japanese occupation, penned his own response by saying that these people were uh, part of a angry minority that were trying to disrupt things and ruin Japan's chances of recovery. The exact wording he used is uh, caution against excesses by disorderly minorities, which is all despite the fact that May Day and Food May Day were really, really orderly events. The fact that almost nobody walked away with uh, any serious injuries and there was basically no property damage says quite a bit. But in the translation to Japanese, his statement used a word called bomin, which means uh, rioters, a uh, mob. So this basically came off as MacArthur trying to frame the event, these people asking for food, as just a simple push for mob rule. And some comments that came out about the writing of the speeches and some of the words used was also used to insinuate that the organizers of this might have been from Russia. Yeah, it seems that whenever something happens that you don't like, you can always blame Russia. 
And despite this rally, the Yoshida government went forward, put together a cabinet, built a coalition, started governing. And the response from General MacArthur led to a dampening of the strength of the movement. But it wasn't counted out yet. Unions were still strong, and unions began to grow their influence over politics and make a more assertive stance for their rights and their privileges as workers. To get rid of those radical public sector unions, the government threatened to root out anybody who was a dissident and fire them en masse. Essentially, it would be a political purge of the Japanese government to get rid of people who were a little too far to the left for their taste. But these unions were working in solidarity, so there were massive strikes across the country in October of 1946. And after they saved those workers, they then planned for a massive general strike on February 1st, 1947. This was going to be the watershed moment of this peaceful revolution. They would get the government change they needed through this massive general strike and everything would begin to change. And it did look like things were heating up. Posters showed up in every corner of the country, even really rural areas that no one would expect. And there was a massive bout of negotiation between the government and a major labor union that began to break down just a couple days before the event. So there was a lot of energy starting to heat up about this big general strike. MacArthur responded to calls for a general strike, calling it a social weapon. You'd think this would have been picked up by now, but this was the event that caused the more radical members of the Japanese left to find out that MacArthur was not indeed their friend and that the Americans didn't actually care about democracy, which like, you know, for me, a cynical person in 2020 is like, duh, but, uh, you know, there was some honest, earnest belief that Americans were going to do the right thing this time. So yeah, uh, the Japanese left was a little disheartened that the bringers of democracy were all of a sudden so against democracy. Now the United States responded to this strike by taking the leader of this, a man named Ai Yashiro, and bringing him to the headquarters of the U.S. occupation to talk about the strike. They put him in a room and gave him a form where he was going to declare that the strike was cancelled. Ai, of course, refused because he was not a dictator. He was the spokesperson for a union that makes democratic decisions. You can't just cancel a strike on the decree of one man. So in response, military police threatened him with, with guns. This wonderful quote that came out afterwards was that Japanese workers are not American slaves. Japanese workers are not fools. But despite that, he eventually caved and signed the form and gave a tearful address to the nation on the radio, where he declared the general strike canceled. And I do mean literally tearful. There's like pictures of him wiping tears from his eyes after doing this. Afterwards, IE called this moment the proof that Americans were not here to create a democracy. They were here to create an American puppet state. This would be the ultimate defeat of this rising, uh, crescendoing movement, if you will, but in 1947, socialists did put together, briefly, a uh, governing coalition. And unfortunately, despite the strike in 1946, in 1949, there was a massive red purge of people in public service. And many people who were part of the far left were expelled from their jobs in government. And this is a common story we hear whenever we tell the story of leftists and labor organizers, a story of defeat destruction, and, you know, unachieved goals. But one of the important things I want to talk about when it comes to this case is that it's not always a story of complete defeat. Yes, Japan didn't have its socialist revolution in 1947. Trust me, I think if it did, we'd have heard about it. But the left did play a massive role when it came to the democratization of Japan especially when it came to labor laws. That's why in Japan, unions are still fairly strong, especially compared to the United States. Marxism in Japan is an accepted analytic framework for understanding the world. Marxism is inside the Japanese Overton window. It's a common form of activism. There are Marxist political parties still in Japan. And even though the strike didn't happen, and the labor movement was weakened through that, 
they were still a significant faction of Japanese politics that needed to be accommodated. And that's the reason why Japanese economics and politics are very different from America's. Japan has a strong welfare state. It has strong labor laws. And the Japanese government does a lot more economic management to its benefit. And in the following decades, Japan would grow to become one of the most powerful economies in the world. To this day, communists and socialists still get elected to their main governing body and still have a voice over public policy. And during the ensuing Cold War, one of the biggest critics of American foreign policy, especially through Japan, were socialists and communists who had a voice in government. So what this means is that sometimes a loss isn't always a total loss, and that even a losing fight can be worth fighting, which says some positive things, although, you know, the deadline of things like climate change mean that uh, we might not be able to be so patient, but it does mean that political fights are worth having, even ones you know you're going to lose. Anyways, if you want to hear about another great leftist movement, I will point you to my video on the Paris Commune. On top of that, this channel's been kind of blowing up in the last couple weeks, so if you're one of the several thousand new people who found this channel in the last little bit, hi, nice to see you, thank you for joining, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.